Hi everyone, my name is Wana and this is Culture Diary. Our guest today is an award-winning photographer and artist whose work has traveled all corners of the globe. Recently, he's become a curator and founder of numerous platforms as well. I'd like you to join me as I welcome Uche Okpa Iroha. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for being here. I know <laughs> I, you're a very busy man. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, as I always say, our guard at the top. So you you're also my guard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I want to, you know, you've been, you've done so much work. Yeah. Everybody know, everybody in the art world knows your name. Mm -hmm. um, but you also started off with sort of documentary photography before moving into yeah. art photography. And I want to know about that transition and what propelled it as well. I actually um, started photography uh, in early 2006. But prior that, I was involved in kidney uh, awareness uh, campaign. But the incident or the, the uh, event that changed the whole script was um, the um, exhibition at the South London Gallery, you know, that involved depth of field and was created by Akimbo Dakimbe. So we had um, Kelechi Amadeobi, T.Y. Bello, Uche James Zerohan, who is my cousin, um, Emeko Kereke, the founder of Invisible Borders, Ameza Jeker. And, you know, these are my friends. So I happened to be in London at the same time with them and, you know, and seeing the exhibition was like, wow, is this photography? I'm going to do this. And the following day, I bought a camera and I traveled and started photographing. Then um, I think it was around uh, March that um, Gote Institute you know, had this um, uh, project at the, when they used to be at the Uzumban, by the way. And um, the workshop was themed, the football was prior to um, the Germany 2006 World Cup. And luckily, I was selected and I got involved in that workshop. And I, you know, you know, started photographing, and that was my entry point. And uh, in Nigeria uh, at that time, we didn't really have indigenous platforms where you go in to learn photography. You always need to hang around these guys, you know, you know, make your photos, make your mistakes, then bring it to them to look at. So street was my classroom, you know, and I had all these guys around me who, you know, I just said, oh, can you look at this for me? And we were doing film, and no digital law. We were doing film, make your photo, print on contact, you know, contact prints and, you know, go through it and edit and, you know, take it to one or two people who are involved, were involved with photography and, you know, make their critics. And um, that was how my photography started. It was basically street and um, until 2011 when, you know, uh, my lens changed, you know, I, I turned the lens to myself, I became more conceptual. Tell, me, like, tell me a bit <laughs> about that, that, you know, what just moved to how it moved to conceptual photography for you? Okay, I was at, um, I just gained uh, admission into the Rijks Academy in Amsterdam to, you know, do a two-year residency. And <laughs> before I left, I had this list of things, photography projects I was going to do. And um, um, basically, they were all street photography. So um, when I arrived at the Rijks Academy, we had this, um, I think it was a two-week uh, uh, excursion and get to know yourself, you know, where you had all the staff, students, you know, artists in one plane going to, uh, we went to Rome. And after that two weeks, I, the whole thing changed for me. And I said, I tore the list up. You know? Wow. And I said, I'm going to try and keep an open mind, learn from everybody here. And that was how everything changed. And also because of the experience I had there, you know, this issue of racism and everything. And I said, it's about time to start questioning you know, issues about stereotyping representation of the African body. And I really got interested with that, um, that transatlantic dislocation and relocation, you know, the slave trade yeah. and the impact on the continent and also the product, I mean, this, you know, uh, African Americans and diaspora Africans. So that was how my lens changed and I started using myself as a subject to, you know, you know draw the attention back to the continent. So, you know, speaking of conceptual photography, you, you move from streets, you move to conceptual. Mm. And I want to know sort of what that experience has been like for you as an artist. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, streets is, is, is really about that, those elements you can't control and just things you just see yeah, and you're, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. you're photographing on the whim. Yeah. But with conceptual photography, there's a lot of construction and deconstruction, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, that yeah, goes on yeah, with it as yeah, well and, yeah. and creation of yeah, images. Yeah. And I want to know how that sort of, process has has felt for you as an artist just being able to shift yeah by the way i still do i still do street <laughs> <laughs> okay um it, it, it's it hasn't been easy and because um 
like you know what I tell the you know this upcoming generation of photographers is that you know the street you know what it does is that it kind of um, shapes you you know because of our climb you know Nigeria Africa there are so many elements out there on the street and you really need to pay much attention to what is happening around you and I remember when I did an exhibition in in in, in Lyon in the artist statement I, I I wrote I'm a confrontational photographer you know I confront issues on the street you know and you know I try to know what is going on around me and also to report it as a story you know and I do like narratives like a project series so when you look at my work like the underbridge life you see it's a series mm -hmm. it's a series of over 25 images it's not a single image yeah. and that's another issue you know most of what uh, artists do today or photographers do today they, you know you see all uh, these downfall buses yellow buses they are, they are very nice the aesthetics you take it bam you know it's just a single image but how do you take it far further from there you know to develop it into a story other people can relate to and it becomes relevant in our society so for me what um, street photography did for me was that it helped me to develop that you know language you know you know because photography is the language even now in contemporary times and also you can use it to address any issue it's limitless from politics uh, religion uh, economy even philosophical you know you can use it to address all these issues so what I do is you know, find uh, a topic in the society that affects me and other people around me. Then I take it, you know, you know, stage by stage, you know, step by step, and I develop it into um, a series, into a project. And it takes quite some time. I'm not like there are some of my colleagues who are very, you know, what I say, like um, prolific, you know, and every month they are churning out, you know, projects. But I'm, I take time to develop my work, and um, you know, you know. You know, presented in a manner where you know the onlooker, you know, will see it and understand what I'm doing, and it's different from the conceptual. Both ends, both sides, they they, they still require research. I do a lot of research, and the conceptual is uh, you can sit down here and say, okay, whatever you see on the street, you can still conceptualize it in your studio. You know, apart from, instead of going to the street and photographing with the you know cityscape and other elements, you can still reconstruct it in a studio in a very conceptual manner and it will still have the same power that's a message you know so you know that's <laughs> you, talk, you talked about um you know the fact that when you started you, mm. you guys were using film you yeah, know and mostly yeah, yeah mostly film yeah. And something that has happened with sort of the, this digital revolution yeah. is the accessibility yeah, yeah, to yeah. photography, whether yeah, yeah. it is people picking up a camera and, and shooting <laughs> and, or, or <laughs> phone and, and shooting and yeah. um Again, democratizing images, you yeah, know, yeah, we're turning yeah, it yeah. Per, per second, as you say, yeah, per yeah. second, per second. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to know, what are your thoughts on, on that? Because, you know, there are people who have a bit of a gripe with it, that mm -hmm. people just pick up a camera and now they're photographers and mm. they almost don't earn the stripes, mm. you know, mm. to be called a photographer. You. Yeah, I and I, I want to know what your, your opinions and you know, your thoughts uh, are. Like you said, you know, because of um, the advent of technology and the digital evolution, we started around in the 90s you know and it's now you know grown so much and and uh, even the camera is now very accessible to everybody you have it on, on the android on the iphone and all sorts of phones so you can easily make a photograph and post it online for people to say back in the days like i mentioned we worked with film and that was what i learned with you know film and you have to be careful before you make too short because you need to <laughs> look at the views, the points of views and your yeah. position, you know, your stand. Where do I need to make this photo? Then you, uh, at the end of the day, you just for a, for a subject, you can make like two shots and, and you go. But now we have digital camera everywhere, you know, DSLRs and everything, and everybody carries the camera. It, it looks easy. Do you understand? Mm. It looks easy, but it's not very easy, you know, because there must be the reflexive angle of photography or to photography where you bring in education. You really need to teach people the intricacies of photography, what it stands for. You know, there's this um, Greek goddess called the Janus. You know, it has, uh, I think it has a two face. You know, you see it's both back and forth. So photography can allow you to do that. But you have to really, you know, look at the critical aspect 
of photography, like where you are critically engaged with your space and you are reporting your space in a very critical manner, you know, and you have a position too. But most photographers today, well, I remember one of my colleagues said recently, not everybody that carries the camera is a photographer. You know, people are making their image makers, you know, but not everybody is a photographer. For me, a photographer is someone who knows how to use the tool, one, and be able to use that tool and to use that tool to report what is going on around him and understand that photography is a language. You can address any issue, even like look at our polity now. How many photographers are reporting the Nigerian polity? For example, how many photographers were in, like in the forefront in this fight against the Boko Haram? Mm. When you look at the American um, uh, visual imagery, especially um, images that came out from the Vietnam War and World War II, photographers were in the front line, you know, and they were reporting. So that's what photography can do, also in international relations. You know, uh, I remember the photo of um, the, the young girl that, you know, in Vietnam in 1972 that, you know, she was running, you know, on the street naked because the Americans were dropping bombs, Nippon bombs, and photography was able to capture that incident. And when you look at, in, at Nigeria, have we, yeah, we have some good photographers who are working on very interesting projects. Have we used photography to an extent that we use it to project the image of our country in a very good manner and also to report what is going on around us? So for me, a photographer is someone who is speaking, who is critically engaged with his space, who have a voice, understand that photography is a language and has a position. Let's go into your work now. One of the um, themes that has been coming up is using, you know, using cinematic yeah, themes in, yeah, in creating yeah, your yeah. work, and that yeah. work has, has, you know, yeah. you've, the Bamako, yeah. um, you the, know, the plantation, the pla boy. yeah, the plantation boy, yeah. and you've won awards for for that work as yeah. well yeah. in Bamako Encounters, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and of course, um, you know, you've also been nominated for the Pre Prete Award too. Yeah, yeah. Um, what brought about that? that work? Because ex just break it down for <laughs> yeah. people who don't know what the work is about. Okay, okay. Um, that work actually, like I mentioned, everything started in, at the Rikes Academy in 2011. Actually, I did a work before that called Veiled. Uh, after I read um, about Franz Fanon and, you know, this, uh, the, the, the black man, white, white mask. mask. Yeah. yeah, so it really inspired me. And also, um, I wanted to do something about, you know, challenging stereotypes, you know, trying to, you know, question, uh, you know, master narratives, you know, and I decided, okay, let me do something, you know, and use myself. That was when, like I said, I turned the lens to myself. I became my own subject. So I, I did that project, failed. And luckily, it, it, it got um, to the, it became a cover page for Kunstblad, uh, it's a Dutch uh, magazine, and it, it's a successful project. Then the following year, that's my second year at the Rikes Academy. I always wanted to do this. I always wanted to do something with the Godfather movie, especially part one. And um, I started asking questions. Even I, I spoke to, I remember I spoke to B.C. Silva and um, Akim Bode, Akim Bode. I said, this is what I want to do. Uh, can I? Because I needed advice in everywhere. Even Charles O'Kerika, I had to send them emails to you know, get some advice how, how to proceed. But at the end of the day, I made up my mind, I'm going to do this. And uh, what I wanted to do, like I mentioned, was to, you know, throw more light on that relocation thing, you know, that dislocation, that at last transatlantic, you know, migration and how, you know, the effect on the African-American. And also it impacts Africa too, yeah. in one way or the other, both directly and indirectly, even diaspora Africans in Europe and all over the world. So I decided to use this particular movie. And at that point, The Godfather was celebrating the 40th year, 40 year of production. It was released on um, March 16, 1972. So I said, okay, this is the right time to you know, pay a tribute to a well-made movie. And it's a legacy. It's one of the best movies ever. It's evergreen. I still watch it, even up to uh, two days ago. <laughs> I had to watch it again. You know? So I decided to use it as, um, as a reference point for what I wanted to say about Africa. Because when you look at, watch the movie, you see that misrepresentation and underrepresentation of the African American. Because in that society, blacks, Africans contributed to the building or to the development of that country, 
you know, they are part of their fabric. So, and when you look at the movie, there's nowhere you see the African-American, yeah? Mm. Apart from the stable, the horse stable, where, remember the um, yeah. uh, young uh, Robert Duvall who played the counselor, went to, you know, visit the director to, you know, create space for uh, a journey to be part of the movie. So that was the only place mm. the black man was shown. And another scene was um, in the meeting of the five dons, when the don wanted to bring back his son from exile. And there was a statement that really got me. At first, I, I, I never really understood that part until I listened and listened and listened. I found out, uh, one of the reasons why the godfather, was that his life was attempted was that because he didn't want to do drugs, you know. And he wanted to bring back his son. I said, I'm, I'm a superstitious man. I want to bring back my son. If he has a headache, I go catch somebody here. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the dons said that, let's sell black, drugs to the black people. They are animals. Let them kill themselves. So that was another part of that. So I said, OK, let me question this movie. Not just, I, I didn't want to dis, uh, kind of um, do anything that would be derogatory to the film, but also to add some value but draw attention you know, to it. So when I decided to in, uh, kind of intrude into that space you know, to draw attention to Africa, and when you look at it, everybody, in, when you look at the images, we are almost at the same level. So there is this co-vality. You know, you know, that stereotypical knowledge representation of Africa is the Europe or the West is at this level, and the Africans are down at this level. So I wanted to bring both parties to the same level. So there's this covality, you know, we exist in the same time and in the same era. And at times when you see Africa being represented in Europe, you see more of the Europeans represented in a very classical manner. Africans, we are not. So these are some of the things I wanted to address, you know, and I decided to use cinematic narratives. And that is how I work now. So I use cinematic narratives to you know, look at um, mini media dynamics of race. And also you know that in Hollywood there is this um, hierarchy, hegemony of whiteness. And, but it's not so. It shouldn't be that way. You, see, you have people like Denzel Washington, all these guys doing interesting stuff in, in Hollywood. But they are not really, you know, they are yeah. now, they complain about it. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There should be that covality at the same time. If a white man is winning an award, a black man should win an award. She, he, should, he or she, a black person, he or she should be recognized for what they've done, their contribution to that society. Not just in the economy, but also in entertainment. You've become a gatekeeper. <laughs> a gatekeeper. <laughs> in, in some I way. Don't care about I mean, <laughs> you've, you know, you, you, you've established um, uh, the right to your platforms. You have the yeah. Lele Institute. Yeah. You have Open Range. Biggest Open Range. Biggest Open Range. Yeah. Um, you're also part, you're just part of different collectives as well. You also yeah. have photo, photo, photo party. party. Legos, yeah. So, I mean, you know, what, what is the function of, and you've also become a curator too. Yeah. So what's, what's the function of, of a lot of these collectives and organizations that okay. you have? Okay. And, you know, moving from just being an artist mm. to somebody who is heralding artists. Yeah. What, what, what's the reason? I, 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 maybe here I'll go spiritual. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> Please feel I, free. I think it's a call. You know, I think it's a call for me, you know, to do what I'm doing now. And uh, I think God has given me the grace, you know, uh, to do what I'm doing. You know, it, there comes a time in your life when, you know, God begins to give you value, you know, add value to you so that you can do something in the future. And I think that's what is happening to me. I remember when I finished at the Rice Academy, there was so much pressure for me to stay back. Uh, you know, I said, no, I'm not going to stay back. Uh, what, everything I've learned here... I'm going to go back to Nigeria and I'm going to set up the Lele Institute because I think God wanted me to go to the Rikes Academy knowing that if Uche comes to this place, Uche will want to do something. And that was what instigated the Lele Institute. Right from the end of my first year, I was already thinking the Lele Institute. And I started making calls. I remember when I was coming back, I called Akim Bode Akimbi. You know him? He's a yes. the Berlin-based Nigerian yeah, photographer. Nigeria. He's my mentor, almost like a father uncle to me. I, I, I spoke to him. I said, ah, Uncle, I'm going back to Lagos and I want to start up the Lele Institute. I don't have any space. He said, Uche, don't worry. Start somewhere. I know who you can talk to. Speak to Mark Andres, Mark Martin, the former Gotenzo. He'll, he'll, he's, he's a cool guy. He's going to support you. 
that was how the Indian Institute started. And we started from there. And we started working. So what, what's, what's, the, what's the, the, the essence is, of the Indian The essence of the Indian Institute, like I mentioned before, we didn't have platforms, indigenous platforms, where young people can come in and learn photography in a very professional manner. I learned on the streets. I'm more of an autodidact. You know, I teach myself. I still do that. So instead of allowing this generation to, you know, double and try and, uh, trial and error, let, let's teach them in a very systematic way. So we set up the Nlele Institute, and we have a cohort, cohort of faculty, different experiences, ideas, opinions. Let's build a faculty so that it's not just one person you are listening to. We can have uh, maybe uh, Amezo Jokere coming in, Abraham or Webase, Andre Sebo, T.Y. Bello, they've all come in too, you know. So it's a broad-based platform where we find them. We are not interested in big names, so we go out there, we open calls, uh, come in, okay, we find them, we develop them, and we put them out there, you know, make them visible. And that's where the Lagos Open Range comes in. Lagos Open Range gives visibility to this young artists who have that promise to, you know, excel in the future and who have that ability to be consistent. So we created the Lagos Open Ring to say, okay, other platforms can be, you know, most exhibitions or festivals have limits. So not everybody can enter into Bamako. Not everybody can enter into Lagos Photo. Not everybody can go to Addis Photo Fest. So let's give these young people the platform where it can become a springboard where they can confess, show their work, and now introduce themselves into uh, the photography scene in the continent and also internationally. So, and the interesting thing, <laughs> in 2015, we, it, it, luckily for us, it fell in the same year uh, with Bamako. So what we did, we took the exhibition to Bamako as an, as an auxiliary, you know, exhibition, as an off. So, and we showed it in Bamako. So those photographers who showed in Lagos, had the opportunity to also show in Bamako. So we are trying, you know, to find a way where, you know, these artists, these photographers can, you know, also connect with curators, galleries, and also their contemporaries. Yeah. I mean, I think at this point I'd like to say thank you because, you know, <laughs> it, it, being, a, being an artist can be a very selfish thing. Yeah. You, you want to look after yourself, yeah, but it I think it's incredibly <laughs> generous to want to say, yeah. you know what, yeah. let's give an opportunity to others coming yeah. behind yeah. us as yeah. well. Yeah. Yeah. To paint and draw like Victor Ekemena. <laughs> that guy is a genius. <laughs> Favorite living artist. Bruce on Lime. Lime? Yeah. Somebody has said this before. Why? Why it's lime? It's caustic, acidic. You know, it, it, some way it's kind of washes clean. Somehow, oh. that's why. Humble. Okay. Your job. <laughs> Which, which of my children is it out here? <laughs> <laughs> Lady Smith, Black Mamba. So. My way in the power, see my, my I like that music. Biggest regret. Not started, maybe not starting hard when I should start it. Oh. Yeah. It's true to yourself. Study, be focused. Yes, art can change the world because art is very vital. Art is like food we eat. If we don't have art, maybe we'll all be dead. Because art has a role in the society where you know, certain issues about humanity, about human living, can be represented through art. And no other kind of form can do that. Art does that all the time, which it does great. <laughs> <laughs> that is your shortest answer so far. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much you so for much. coming on the show. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'd like to say a big thank you to our guest, Mr. Uche Oba Iroha, for coming on the program. I'd also like to say a big shout out to Sus Productions for letting us use their beautiful studio. And if you do like the video, please make sure you subscribe and give us a thumbs up and share with your friends as well. Don't forget, until next time, art is life.